Welcome to each and every one of you. I'm excited. This is the last service of the weekend. Uh, for you, it's the first, but we've been going since yesterday. And uh, it's been good. Great to see all of God's people coming over the weekend and worshiping God. We're in Luke chapter 7. Look for Luke chapter 7. If you're struggling with 7, find 6 and then go to the next chapter. Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> That call is not straight from God. Please don't take it. You found it? Uh, Shall we begin? All right. We're back in the gospel of Luke. Luke is about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is uh, one of the four gospels spelling out the incarnation of Christ and the ministry of Christ. So Jesus comes. He proclaims himself as the gospel. Five items of what the gospel is, the outfolding of the gospel. And he says that as he shows in his miracles, the healing, the giving of forgiveness, the different arenas, how he in fact is redeeming creation back to himself. He's redeeming creation back to himself. So Luke's very uh, particular about that which he does in terms of forgiveness, in terms of human relationships, behavior, especially physical healing. Alright, that's where we are. Now we're in chapter 7 of Luke. We're looking at verse 35. 36 through to verse 50. Luke chapter 7 verse 36 through to verse 50. Keep your Bibles open. Keep it right there. Listen to me. I want to tell you the story. Because it's a story. You know. But you have to trust me. It's there. You'll check it later. A chapter or two before that, the Pharisees are having a problem with Jesus and his disciples. And they sneak over to the disciples, tap them on the shoulder and say, What is wrong with this guy? He is eating and drinking with sinners. That means professionals. The non-clergy, the lay people. He's eating and if he's a rabbi, if he's a prophet, what's he doing with them? And look at him, he just, he's just, you know, eating, drinking with them, associating with them. There's every chance he might be thought of as one of them. What is this? But the very next chapter, you go to chapter 7, and here he is in the home of a Pharisee named Simon. Not to be mixed up with Simon Peter, that's why he gave you his surname, Simon Peter. It's not this. Never mind. So that's Simon Peter, the disciple, and you've got Simon the Pharisee. He's also called Simon, Simon, and he's at his table. Simon the Pharisee has thrown him a bit of a banquet, and he has men all around the banquet. Again, remember, this is a dastarkhan. You know, dastarkhan, the long table that's about one, one and a half feet off the ground. Right? So when you're sitting, you are kind of reclining at that table. You use the diwan type cushions, you know, the ones we used to have in the front room. Where you sleep, watch TV, get up, don't know what we're doing. Anyway, those ones. So you're kind of reclining, lying down, and your feet are towards the outside. So some sort of like a mattress or a thick carpet, and your feet are to the outside, and your face is toward the table, and everyone's facing each other. So if you looked from on top, it was like a star. Okay, everyone's feet are away from each other, from, from the table, and they're reclined. Maybe it was tiring eating. I get tired sometimes, you know, while eating, and they lie down a little bit, and then <laughs> get up. I, I don't know. So anyway, they had, and so the nans and the malaitika was spot on, everything was great, they were enjoying this meal, and all of a sudden, right in the middle of a very beautiful, exciting time, talking to this new rabbi, the new kid on the block, one one with tremendous wisdom and understanding, the drapes towards the entrance of the room there, open, and a woman walks through, she's probably good looking, she's very well dressed, she's too well dressed, and the, the men are all suddenly very uncomfortable, this woman is a woman of the city, a woman of the city, some would go as far as to translate it as a whore, or a prostitute, or a harlot. But I'm not going to go that far, but she's definitely a loose woman, a fashionable woman, a woman of the city, a woman very promiscuous. And everybody seemed to know what her character was. All the men were suddenly very uncomfortable, and Simon the Pharisee definitely very uncomfortable. Jesus is looking in the direction of the guys, he's talking, he is in conversation, and this woman slips by behind and comes and stands behind Jesus. And he just, she just stands behind Jesus at his feet. And begins to weep. She begins to weep. Her makeup flows. Everything that was, you know, affluent and 
confident about her is melting into this remorse and regret and repentance as she stands at Jesus feet and weeps and weeps in an uncontrollable weeping her tears fall to his feet as if to wash his feet enough to wash his feet She brought with her an alabaster box of ointment, a flask of ointment. And she breaks that and she pours it all over his feet and then wipes her feet, his feet with her hair. So she's standing, then she's kneeling to wipe his feet with her hair. And then she kisses his feet. So she's bowing, standing, kneeling, bowing. She began to wet his feet with her tears, wipe his feet with her hair, kiss his feet and anoint them with ointment. What an incredible moment. The men are awkward, uncomfortable, nobody knows how to react in this situation. And Simon in the middle of all of this, his thoughts are this. If this guy was a real prophet, if he was an authentic prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. These were Simon's thoughts. The Pharisee, the custodian of the law, the one who was to lead his nation to bring all other nations to the grace of God. His thoughts were, he's not a real prophet. If he were a real prophet, he would know who, is, who this woman is, who is touching him. Jesus knew his thoughts. Jesus knew the woman was standing over there. Jesus doesn't turn to tell the woman, address the woman, do anything about it. She's bawling her lungs out there. He's, giving, he's letting her do her thing. He turns to Simon. He says, Simon, I've got something to tell you. Simon, I have a story to tell you. Go on, sir. I'm listening. There was a money lender. And there, was a, there were two debtors that this money lender had money owing to him. One debtor owed five denarii and the other debtor owed 50 denarii. 50 is 10 times off. Five, two debtors, five and fifty. Both came to him, both were unable to pay, and the money lender said to both of them, I am cancelling both your debts, go in peace. I am cancelling both your debts, go in peace. He forgave both their debts, cancelled their debts, and sent them all away. Simon, I have a quiz for you. Simon, tell me, which of the two would love him more? Which of the two would love him more. Simon pulls all his intelligence together, his experience and all his maturity and says, I suppose uh, uh, the, the one whose uh, debt was greater, I suppose would be the one who would love greater. Simon, you are absolutely right. You have judged correctly. You have judged correctly, Simon. The one whose debt has been cancelled, that is greater, will love greater will love greater. The one who had a greater debt. Simon, you're absolutely right. Now Jesus moves into teaching this man a lesson about love and forgiveness and the relationship between these two. That love is proportionate to forgiveness. Where there is greater forgiveness, there is greater love. Love stems from the greatness of forgiveness. He teaches this. Jump with me to 47. 47, he says, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, and we all know that, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Are, A-R-E, are forgiven. For she loved much. As if to say, because it has been forgiven much, she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, note that in your Bibles, he who is forgiven little, what? Loves little. Are you with me? He who is forgiven little, loves little. And Jesus goes on to say, and he said to her, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. Out of the mouth of the Savior himself, your sins are forgiven you. And those around the table murmured, who is he to forgive sins? So it's not just Simon the Pharisee, everybody else around the table now, Jesus teaches about the relationship between love 
and forgiveness. I find this statement very, very intriguing. I tweeted about it yesterday. Very, very intriguing. He who is forgiven little, loves little. Oh, oh, Jesus, where did love come from all of a sudden? We're talking about forgiveness. There's this prostitute type woman over there. She is promiscuous. We all know she's supposed to be a filthy woman. You're not, you, you shouldn't let her touch you. She touches most men for the wrongest reasons. You shouldn't. You are a rabbi. You are holy. You are sacred. You do, come on. You, don't you know? Don't you know? Where does love come from? What is the first commandment? What is the first commandment? Love the Lord. Your, don't, don't, say it confidently. Yeah, this is not a recipe. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Putting all four Gospels together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That is the first commandment. Who is the Pharisee? He is the keeper of the commandments. If anyone who should know the commandments is the Pharisee and the Pharisee should know that the number one commandment is to love the Lord your God. Jesus, what is your point? What is the point you're trying to make for Simon? Pharisee, keeper of the law, custodian of the law. Your first law that you should know by heart is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul. Simon, let me teach you something about love. Let me teach you something about love. I'm going back to the statement. He who forgives little loves little. Love's letter. Love flows out of gratitude for the forgiveness. And that forgiveness flows out of grace. Love flows out of gratitude for the forgiveness that flows out of grace. How much grace? How much grace? Great grace. Say great grace and now you can say it confidently. Great grace. Therefore great Forgiveness, therefore great love. Are you with me? Jesus is trying to make a point here. He's trying to make a point here. He says, he who is forgiven little, loves little. Are you with me? Now think. Think. Let me ask you a question. Who's been forgiven little? You? You? Anybody upset? Who, who would stand up and say, I've been forgiven little. Who, 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 who's who's going to dare to stand up in the face of God's grace and holiness before a cross where Jesus shed all his blood for you and died the death of a martyr, died the death of a, of a criminal for you. Who's going to stand up and say, Who's been forgiven little? Answer, no one! No one! Think about the statement Jesus is making. He who is forgiven little, loves little. Who's been forgiven little? No one. Point being, everyone's been forgiven with confidence. Everyone's been forgiven much. Everyone should love much. Simon, if you sit there thinking that you are anything less than that woman, Simon, if you think that having the Bible in your hand and going to church every Sunday, if you think that, you're a constitu- that you hold the constitution of everything that is holy and righteous, if you think from any angle that you have been forgiven anything less than that woman, you wake up, man. You wake up because there is no one who has been forgiven little. There is no church member, no one who has been good, good all their life, never done the bad things all their life. Someone who is all put together, never went off track, never used a bad word. There is nobody who has been forgiven little. We all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We have all gone astray like sheep, like morons, like idiots. Everyone's gone their own way. And the Lord took our sin and nailed it to the cross. Do you get that? Do you get that? There is no one who has been forgiven little. Because your sin is matched up not against the sin of the prostitute or anybody else. Your sin stands in stark contrast to the holiness of God. And by that standard, all have fallen short. Simon, where is your love? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Also. The law. Custodian of the law. Where is your love? Where is your love? Simon, I came into your house, Simon. And you didn't have water to wash my feet. Normally, hosts 
when they invite guests to the house, Simon, we come walking in the dust. And the first thing you do is you get on your knees and you wash their feet. That's the done thing, Simon. That's called ministry. If you loved me, Simon, you would serve me. You would serve me. Where's the water that you would wash my feet with? You never wash my feet. This woman walked in and from the time she walked in, she's been wetting my feet with her tears, Simon. With her tears. Where is your love, Simon? If you loved me, you would serve me. Where is your love, Simon? If you loved me, you'd worship me. From the time I walked in, you never gave me a kiss of affection, a kiss of brotherly acceptance, a kiss of family. You never welcomed me with a holy kiss, as is our custom. But this woman, ever since she walked in, has been kissing not my face, but my feet. That's worship, Simon. If you love me, Simon, where is your worship? You never anointed my head with oil. This woman has been anointing my feet with oil. With the alabaster box of ointment that she adorned herself with. She now has laid at my feet, Simon. Simon, if you love me, where's your worship? Because the appropriate response to forgiveness, the appropriate response to genuine repentance is ministry and worship. And the Christian who is not serving and the Christian who cannot open his mouth to worship and love and express his love to God is a fake And has never experienced repentance as that woman knew it. Simon, if you ever experienced forgiveness... If you ever experience forgiveness, it's going to show in your service, it's going to show in your worship, it's going to show in the way you let everybody know that you have been forgiven much. Because Simon, you have been forgiven much. The woman is weeping at Jesus' feet, she's standing there, she's absolutely bawling her lungs out, she is absolutely broken, she's crying, she has not said a word, she has not drawn attention to herself, she is there at his feet, kissing his feet, she just don't want to let go of herself, she's finally found the person who will lift this burden of guilt from off her shoulders. The life she has led will now be wiped clean because of this one person right there. She is in the presence of her saviour. And Jesus turns to Simon Peter and Simon, sorry, not Simon Peter, Simon the Pharisee. And Simon is looking away because he doesn't want to look at this woman. She's a cheap woman. She's a, she's, a, uh, she's a woman of the city, a loose woman. And we are holy men. We are righteous men. Oh, we're not even going to make eye contact with her. None of the men looking in her direction. Jesus leaned over onto the table and grabbed that fat chin of his and turned it and said, look at her. Simon, look at her. You look, you look at her. And then reluctantly his eyes moved towards this sick woman. And there she is broken, wet in her tears, almost at his feet, kneeling and bowing. So look at her Simon, that is what is going to get her, her forgiveness. That is what is going to get her forgiveness. And nothing that you have is going to get you your forgiveness. Or has gotten you your forgiveness. Simon... You need repentance just as much as she needs repentance. You may be a custodian of the law. You may know the law inside out, back to front. But you, just like her, need to repent. You need to repent. Without a repentance experience, a repentance that leads to salvation, God will not accept people. Doesn't matter if your grandmother is a Christian. Doesn't matter if everyone in your church went to, uh, in your family went to church. Doesn't matter if all generations have been going to church. Doesn't matter which church you've been going to. Doesn't matter how many verses in the Bible you know. If there has not been a genuine repentance experience where you can take your memories back to that moment when you stood at Jesus' feet and you bawled your lungs out because the weight of your sin was too much and you found Jesus, the Savior. You found Him and you handed your sin over to Him. If you cannot remember that and you did not repent of your sin you do not know the forgiveness of God is it any wonder that so many people so called Christians don't show the love that Jesus shows because they don't know the forgiveness that Jesus gives Simon look look at her look at her you need repentance have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's called visiting the cross or revisiting the cross. Every single believer must know this in their journey. Often, as often as you can, revisit the cross. I'm not saying to revisit your sin, but revisit the extent of your sin. Revisit the punishment that went on Jesus for your sin. Revisit the fact that you one day handed over your sin to Jesus and he covered it. He covered it. We need to have a visit to the cross regularly. Revisit that moment when you started over with, with God. Revisit that time when you hung in, in shame and it so overwhelmed you that you couldn't stop crying. Do you remember that time? Do you remember that time? That's right. You don't. Some of you don't. Either because you were never was, never was, or... It's been so long that you revisited the extent of your sin that you now think you were forgiven little. You were forgiven little. And that's the danger of not revisiting the cross. Not revisiting the cross. But you go to the cross and you see the blood falling from the, from the body of Christ. You see the pain, the agony. You see him screaming out in, in pain. You see the agony. You see the wrath of God being poured out on him. And you see the punishment that, was, that, that he did not deserve. And you realize it is your sin that put him there. And then as you see him die and scream out, it is finished. It is finished. You get up from your knees and you sing, oh, oh my sin, oh the bless." Of this glorious thought. My sin not in part. But the whole. Has been nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh my soul. Worship. Worship. That regular estimation. And revisit of how much you have been forgiven. Is going to result in an everyday fervor. To worship Jesus and to serve Jesus. You struggle to worship God? Song is not coming out? Song is not coming out? Don't feel like singing today? Not in the mood? Rapesh! You have forgotten the sin that was covered. The debt that was covered. You have forgotten to be grateful. Not forgotten to be grateful. Forgotten how it is to be grateful. Don't feel like serving others, too busy, don't have the resources, don't have the time, don't have the energy, don't have the motivation. That's not the problem. The problem is not schedule. The problem is not time. The problem is memory. The problem is memory. My sin or the bliss. Every single one of us must revisit the cross. Revisit the cross. Four things you got to do as an individual. As an individual, four things you got to do. Number one, remember the extent of your sin. Maybe you're the Pharisee that thinks you've been good all along. You've known the, the law and you followed the law all along. You never backslid, you never did anything wrong, you never went off track, you've been faithful. <laughs> God should be happy, He didn't have to forgive you much. No. There is no one who's been forgiven little. That's the title of today's sermon. No one forgiven little. Remember the extent of your sin. Number two, remember your repentance. That you stood there with the weight of your sin and you handed it over. And remember the voice of God saying, your debt is cancelled. You are forgiven. Go in peace. You are forgiven. Go in peace. Number three. Remember the forgiveness was in accordance to His grace. Let's do that again. His forgiveness was in accordance to His grace. Not according to your sin now if i have sinned this much then he forgave me this much if my wife has sinned this much he has forgiven her this much if you have sinned this much he has forgiven you this much so now we stack up against each other and the experience of his grace is in proportion to our sin no sir that's not how it works 
He forgave according to his grace. In accordance to his grace. So your sin started here and ended here. This much is your sin. How much did he forgive in accordance with his grace? How much is his grace? His grace starts here and goes to infinity and beyond. So having estimated the extent of your sin, get over it. Get over it. Because now your focus is His grace and His grace is much greater than all your sin. Are you with me? So this community must focus not on the sin of a person but on the grace of God. That far outreaches and covers our sin. So you kneel to reiterate, your, to remember your sin but you rise to worship His grace. Are you with me? You rise to worship His grace. So you've got to remember the extent of your sin. Remember your repentance. Remember the forgiveness was in accordance to grace. And fourth, rise to worship and serve. Rise to worship and serve. That's what you want to do as an individual. Regularly, you want to revisit the cross. That's why we sing worship hymns. That's why we sing songs that constantly talk about the cross. And the worship leader leads us to a place where once again, we are revisiting. Why? Because we love our sin? Because we like the gory cross? No. No. Because we want to remember his forgiveness that was great. So that our love might be great. Are you with me? Okay, let's do that. that. First we talked about the individual. Now let's talk about us as a community. Us as a community. So we are all these individuals who have been forgiven much. And we come together. And as a community, we should be a forgiving and an accepting community. Got it? As a community, we must reflect the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a community, we must reflect our forgiveness. That we as a community have been forgiven. What do I mean? Let's flesh this out and then close. How do we deal with people who walk in that door, who are screwed up, messed up, burnt up, and spent? How do we deal with people who have broken every law, lived a debaucherous life, shameful life, lawless life, and they walk into our community, and they walk in here not to meet you or me, but because we're worshipping Jesus, they thought they'll find Jesus here. So they come here and they want to meet with Jesus. They want to stand at Jesus' feet. They want to make their peace with Jesus. They want to cry their heart out and let deal their business with Jesus. They are coming here to meet Jesus. And we are the community of forgiven people. How do we deal with these people? I want us to think about that for a minute. We are a community. And we must reflect that. So how do we do it? How do we accept these people? What do we do? Let me take it further. Let me make it even harder. New people, to, okay, we don't know them from Adam. They lived a debaucherous life. They were bad because they didn't know us. If they knew us, they'd be much better. But they didn't know us. Chalo chordo. Okay? Let's make it harder. What happens when your cousin or brother, or sister, or son, or daughter, or uncle, or auntie, or husband, or, hu- or wife. One of your own, one of our own community falls off the community, falls out with the community, goes down the trail of corruption, of wickedness, of testing the world, gets pulled into the world with all of its sin and its distractions and its colors and its pleasures and they get soaked into a life for a year, for two years, for three years, for five years and they live a horrible life and you know about it because you've been following them on Facebook. You don't just let it sit there in the feed. You follow that link all the way to their profile. And you check out their photos. And you know exactly where they've been. And you know who they've been hanging out with. And you know how many cigarettes they've, they've smoked. You know what, who they've been sleeping with. You keep full track of them. And suddenly, suddenly one day, the love of God gets through to them. And they want to get right with God. And they show up at church. And like, oh, look who's come to church. Wait, look, 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 look. Who's come to church. Their profile pic is still like that only. They haven't changed any audacity to walk into church, man. What do you do? What do you do when someone among us falls in sin? What is the response of a community of forgiven with someone who falls among us? When he falls to the ground, do you kick him while he's there? When he falls to the ground, do you pile on? You know what the pile on thing is in the football thing? You pile on so that he can't 
get up. And you know that. You know there have been people in our community who they fall in some sin, they fall in some habit, they get into a relationship of some sort, it messes them up completely. Now they're hurt and they're guilty. And they have fallen. And what do we do? We pile on them so hard that they just never recover from that. What grace. What grace. Okay, you don't pile on them. What is another thing that churches do? Communities do. They ostracize them. Completely separate them. You can come to the service, but we're not going to talk to you. We're not going to have anything to do. We're not going to call you. not going to involve you. not going to encourage you. you. You botched up. You live with it. You live with it. Or you, maybe you take the other view. Where every opportunity you get, you remind the person that they failed. They failed. They fell apart. They fell out. They backslid. Whatever phrase you want to use for that. The, our, all our favorite phrases for people who have fallen away. And you did that. And we will never let you forget that it is our grace that we allowed you back in here. We were here all along. We never went anywhere. We were faithful. We did all the things of the churchy things that we do. No clue what it is but we do. And you were the one who went. And you sinned all the sins I wanted to. And humiliate them. Humiliate them. My brothers and my sisters and everyone else. Everybody fails. Everybody goes through dry periods in their life. Everybody needs a break from Christians. Tell me you don't feel that. Everybody needs a break from all that we know to be institutional or ritualistic. And we just need to rethink. Sometimes we need to revisit the grace of God. I am not saying we need to sin. But everybody goes through difficult periods. And when they come, I have seen it in my 15 years of ministry here in this church. I have seen it. People, guys, older guys, younger guys. I have seen them who were actively involved. Oh, they were completely involved. And they were excited about their ministry. And they were leading and driving certain ministries of the church faithful they were there every weekend whatever and suddenly because of a relationship or because of something they fell away they disconnected not like they went and did anything bad but it was a dry period in their life the church ostracized them because they were not faithful they were not there they were not dependable one year two years three years go by they come back and those people come to church they get right with everybody everything is fine they are now regular but they never get back to where they were before Because the community will never let them forget that you walked away. You walked away. We stayed here. We are the faithful ones. You walked away. And that, my friends, is pharisaical. It's pharisaical. At that moment, God will take your face and make it face the face of the prostitute and say, "She's she's got it better off right now than you do. No matter who walks through that door, whether we've never met them before, or whether it's somebody's grandchild that has gone off the track and come back, there is room at the cross for you. There is always room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you again. And when people want to get right with God, I'm talking about people who want to get right. When people want to get right with God, the only thing that might stand in the way between them and Christ is a stupid Pharisee who thinks he's been forgiven little. There is love and forgiveness as vast as the heart of God. There is forgiveness for the prostitute. Even a prostitute there is forgiveness. But greater still there is forgiveness for the Pharisee. There is room at the cross for you. Five things that we as a community need to do, need to be, need to say, need to act. To reflect the fact that we are forgiven. To reflect the attitude of the Lord Jesus. Five things and we close. Number one. We need to let people make their peace with Christ. They are sinners. She was a loose woman. She was a woman who lived a filthy dirty life. That's a fact. Yes her sins are many Jesus said. But they are forgiven. People need to come face to face with their sin and they need to make their peace with Christ. Notice, Jesus let the woman cry her heart out. 
Are you with me? She let a woman cry her heart out. She didn't, he did not turn to him. And in the middle of a work, she is crying her heart out. She's bawling. He's giving Simon a hard time. He's letting Simon have it. One session going on over here, she's having her own session. Jesus laid out in the middle. She he didn't turn. No, but it's okay. It's okay. To, oh, forget it. Forget it. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have all that. Don't worry. It takes time, you know. It takes lots of time to change and to do. Don't worry. I forgive you. Everything is fine. So she never deals with her sin. She never deals. She never hears the words, Yes, you are a sinner, but I forgive you. I forgive you. You are forgiven. She never hears it. We need to let people walk into church. We need to let people come back to Christ. But they need to deal with their sin. They need to face off with how they have offended Christ. But they need also to understand that they have sinned. So she wailed. She bawled, she bawled her lungs out. And Jesus let her cry out. When she was all dried out. Then Jesus said, He finished. Your sins are forgiven. Are you with me? Very important. Number one, let people make their peace with God. With Christ. Number two, reiterate the authenticity or the authority Christ has to forgive. Reiterate the authority that Christ has forgiven. We as a community must say, yeah, come in. Deal with your sin with Christ. But we want to tell you that Jesus has the authority to forgive your sin. Where did I get this from? The other men around the table, they whispered to one another, who is, who is this guy that he uh, forgives sin also? Also. Who is this guy that he also forgives sin? We are not like that. This community believes, reiterates and teaches the doctrine that Jesus Christ has the authority to forgive sin. Let me explain. She came and she broke the alabaster box off ointment on Jesus' feet. What was she doing? She was embalming him for his death. What death? The death that he would die to pay for her sin. So who's going to pay for her sin? Jesus. So Jesus is going to pay for her sin. Jesus is going to take her sin and put it on himself and suffer the wrath of God. Jesus is the one who's going to cover her debt. Therefore, he's the one who can cancel her debt. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Okay, I'll give you another one. Let's go back to the money lender. The money lender had two debtors. One five denarii. The other one? Fifty denarii. He said, I cancel both your debt. Why does he have the authority to cancel the debt? Because he is willing to cover the loss. He is willing to bear the loss. He would pay for that five denarii. For the fifty. Do you get it? Do you get it? Who is Jesus to forgive sin? He is the one who paid for it. He has all the authority and before he went to the cross, he accepted that ointment. He accepted that embalming because he knew for a fact that he would go to the cross, he would die for her sin and he would cover it on the basis of the factuality and the certainty that he would do it. He said to his, this woman, daughter, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. Nobody else, no other God, no other idol, no other man, no other leader, no one else has the authority to forgive sin except Jesus Christ. Because he paid for it. He paid for it. So you stand there as a community claiming loudly over and over again that Jesus forgives sin. Number one. Let people make their peace with Christ. Number two, reiterate the authority Christ has to forgive. Number four, number three, embrace people with their brokenness and failure. Yes, she was a filthy woman, but Jesus let her touch him. And Jesus did that because human touch is very, very powerful. Human touch is a language. Human touch says, I accept you, your family. Human touch is huge. Some hugs you give people in church on Sunday is the only hugs they get all week. And that embrace is a mark of acceptance. It's a mark of love. Let people make their peace. Reinstate or reiterate the authority Christ has to forgive. Embrace people with their brokenness, with their failure. Nobody is so dirty. Nobody is so bad off. Nobody is so... A horrible a sinner that they cannot be 
embraced by this community. Number four, welcome people to the table. If Jesus had any uh, right there, he would have asked her to sit down at the table and eat. But the men wouldn't have it. Welcome her to the table. And number five, extend the peace of God which we have in Christ Jesus. Jesus said in verse 50, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. What is peace? Peace is a right standing with God. Peace is a right standing with God. Peace is not a framework of mind. It's not a state of mind. Peace is a legal settlement. It is right standing with God. And you don't have the right to receive that peace from God. But God took the initiative to make peace with you. Even though you were the offending party. God made peace with us. That's why we are not a religion. That's why we are not a religion. A religion is where I try to make peace with God through offerings and works and philosophies and art of living and what not. But this Jesus did. God did. He sent Jesus as the prince of peace. And he made peace with me. He extended his peace to me when I didn't deserve it. So I extend his peace to others when they don't deserve it. Extend the peace of God that we have in Christ Jesus. As a community, we ought to look like Jesus looked. We ought to speak like Jesus spoke. And we got to love like Jesus loved. We do not have a choice but to be an accepting community. Because no one is forgiven little. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Make it personal, make it corporate. What is God asking you personally to do about it? What is God asking us as a community to do about it? On the basis of our attitude and approach, God will give us 1% of Delhi. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Rest and abide with each and every one of us through this week and even forevermore. Amen.